welcome to the Beyond Cinema studio, Mr. Yeah. Nicholas Heitner. Um, firstly, just congratulations on having Lady in the Van here. Thank you. Um, is it luck or fate that brought a, a lady to, uh, to Alan Bennett's uh, driveway that ended up becoming material for him to develop into the, first this stage play and now, and now this film? Well, I think that's one of the things that uh, he tries to answer. Uh, through the way he's written about her over the years. Uh, I think initially uh, fate decreed that this broken down old lady drove a van, a camper van, a mobile home into Gloucester Crescent, which was, um, is a street in North London inhabited by playwrights, uh, novelists, publishers, uh, filmmakers. It's a kind of, uh, it's, it's a kind of epicenter of um, of North London liberal intelligentsia, where they all feel guilty about being successful. They all feel they don't deserve to be as well paid as they are. And I think once she arrived, she realized um, this might be one of the very few places in London where she wasn't going to be eventually moved along. And for five years, she wasn't, until the council tried to move her along. And at that point, um, Alan Bennett, uh, who felt protective of her, uh, offered to her his driveway as a place to park her van for a, for a week or two while she sorted herself out. Yeah. And she stayed there 15 years. It's, a, it's just an incredible, it's an incredible thing to have happened. Yeah. And it's also incredible that it happened to Alan. Yeah. <laughs> and it's incredible that then he chose to write about it. Yeah. And that it then beca has had the success that it's had. Yeah. For you, having had the experience with this material, both for the stage and again and now and then with Maggie Smith for the stage, as well as transitioning to the screen, mm. what freedoms did the new format um, enable you to experiment with that you weren't able to um, when you first uh, first worked with the material? Well, this started as um, a diary in the London Review of Books, which is a London literary periodical that Alan writes for a lot. Uh, he had obviously been watching her and taking notes about her for 20 years. But I'm not sure that he fully knew what he was going to as... But I'm not sure that... He... Wait a minute, I'm going to start this one again. Um, this started as, um, as a diary in the London Review of Books, which is a literary periodical that Alan is a regular contributor to. Um, and he'd obviously been taking notes about Miss Shepherd for 20 years. But I don't think he knew what he was going to do with those notes. Uh, the, the, um, the diary, although it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not a huge circulation periodical, yeah. had a tremendous impact. Uh, because I think, uh, for two reasons, Alan himself is a tone of voice uh, which people recognize uh, in Britain and love. And because she, Miss Shepherd, is such an extraordinary and irresistible character. She is um, ferociously uh, independent, brooks no opposition. She's going to live the life she's determined to live, whatever anybody else says. Uh, and that is extremely funny. Uh, she was, although I'm not sure how much she knew it, extremely funny. So I think the process from the diary to the published memoir to the play, which was back in 1999, and neither Alan nor me nor Maggie Smith remember that much about it, yeah. to the movie now um, has all kind of focused on the same question, which is, um, how can this have happened? What, what was going on? And Alan will never give you a straight answer to that question. Um, he would, I suppose, implicitly point you uh, to the movie, to the memoir, uh, where he asks all sorts of questions, leaves some of them hanging, and um, and I think Maggie answers a lot of them in her performance, and Alex Jennings in his performance. Yeah. Do you think that you having changed personally over 15 years since the play uh, was staged also changes the elements that you bring to that as I've a dramaturg? I I I would guess so. I, I I would guess so. But again, it's it's uh, it's it's a question. I I suppose um, the movie answers, and I'm not fully in control of what that answer is. I I I can make the movie and know that um, the texture of the movie is 
almost uniquely uh, truthful because it happens every, every single frame of what happens in Gloucester Crescent is happening exactly where it happened. The view from Alan's window is exactly the view. The, the texture of Alan's house is what it was. It's not, it's not changed. Yeah. When the van um, drove into Gloucester Crescent again, half the residents of Gloucester Crescent who were there in the 70s and 80s kind of shuddered in horror that it was back. She was back. <laughs> uh, and it, it is really true. That I can promise you. That would be an interesting uh, premise that Alan's driveway becomes a hub that's sought after for literary, you know, literary uh, seeds to be planted. Well, we discovered that um, you can't get a commemorative blue plug from English heritage until you've been dead at least 10 years. So it's to be hoped that the blue plaque that will go up for Alan Bennett, having lived at 23 Gloucester Crescent, doesn't go up for a very, very long time. Uh, English Heritage uh, is not an organization with a great sense of humor, so uh, refused permission uh, for a blue plaque to be put up to Miss Shepherd. Mercifully, Camden Council also puts up blue plaques, and, and they're funny. <laughs> they, so yeah, that they were all right. <laughs> That's great. Otherwise, it, it, was, uh, it would be left to you guys in yeah. the souvenir store somewhere. Yeah. Um, the History Boys was one of those productions that just beautifully leapt off the, off the stage onto the screen as well, obviously led Thank by um, Richard Griffiths and yeah. his amazing performance, but also all those boys have then gone on yeah. to successful careers as well. Yeah. As someone who nurtures talent in a theatre yeah. and then watches these kind of transformations happen, because that was kind of rare at the time when History Boys happened. Yeah. Um, it was rare that that had had such success and then was able to be adapted. Now it's, it seems like it happens with every piece of material, mm -hmm. has to have various media options to it yeah. before it's even staged. Yeah. Uh, but there it seemed like a really fluid process that was just uh, something that was fairly organic in nature. Yeah. Um, what's it like as someone who's a, a director of theatre to nurture that talent on stage and then watch it kind of grow and expand and become kind of internationally renowned? Oh, it's it's uh, it's absolutely thrilling, and it it and and it gives me the most enormous kick. And it's one of the great things about having a degree of longevity in the theatre is that you do see you do see uh, people uh, start out, develop, and get better. Uh, and the smart London-based actors, um, the smart ones, keep coming back to the theatre because that's where they grow. Um, and I would say this, but that's where the great material most uh, reliably is. But it is the medium where the actor's in charge. Yeah. Um, there's a whole mythology around, uh, around um, the superior degree of truth that you will get uh, in a movie performance over the stage. Yeah, maybe, but it is created as much by an editor, a composer, a director, a cinematographer, uh, as it is by an actor. Um, really great actors keep coming back and test themselves on the stage. So just to pluck, so that it doesn't sound as if I'm being kind of pro-British chauvinistic, to pluck one from the air, Kate Blanchett, always on the stage, yeah. just a great, great actor. And now I'm going to give you another, Maggie Smith. No actor working on the British stage, no actor working in British movies or television is held in greater regard or affection by her peers. She goes back to the 50s. She played Desdemona to Laurence Olivier's Othello. She worked with directors like George Cukor and Joe Magovitz. She played Betty Davis's maid. And she has never, ever, at any stage in her career, stopped going back to the stage. So when I look at all those guys in the History Boys, um, I know, I hope, that however celebrated they become, they'll always be coming back and really exercising those muscles on the stage. James Corden, um, he would not disagree with this. James Corden, who, who had this fantastic success with a, a sitcom in Britain called Gavin and Stacey immediately after the History Boys, um, instead of just resting on his laurels, came and really worked himself out in a show called One Man, Two Governors. That was the show that won him the Tony, and I think you could probably draw a straight line from the Tony to this chat show he's now hosting, and he calls me every now and then and says, when are we going to do a play again? And that's what it's all about. 
That's very cool. Well, we appreciate uh, you coming in and sharing some of those moments with us. Not at all. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. And Thank, you Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.